Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 276, recorded on January 18th, 2023. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. If you've ever configured a Linux firewall, then you're probably familiar with NetFilter, the community-driven FOSS project that provides packet filtering and other networking goodies for the Linux kernel, and powers both IP tables and its successor, NF tables. Well... This week, a significant vulnerability was discovered in NetFilter that could leak stack and heap addresses and potentially allow local privilege escalation on vulnerable Linux systems. Indeed, it's known now as CVE 2023-0179, so keep your eyes out for patches that address that. We know at the moment it seems to impact RHEL 9 and, of course, versions of Debian and its derivatives. So you'll want to watch for this one. What happened was a researcher was auditing the RC1 for Linux 6.2, which will be releasing soon, and they discovered this buffer overflow vulnerability. The researcher brought this to the Linux-Distro's mailing list on early January 11th. Red Hat assigned the CVE ID on the same day, and after some concerns raised by Greg KH around the initial disclosure of the flaw, he helped the researcher bring this to the attention of the NetFilter maintainers. The flaw can be exploited when NetFilter reads network packets that have an encapsulated VLAN tag. While processing the packet data, NetFilter fails to account for the possibly increased size of the data it's handling. Specifically, if that data's offset combined with its length goes over the allowed size of the Ethernet and VLAN headers combined, then the length is adjusted to copy the bytes that are within the boundaries, but the remaining bytes are copied directly from the socket buffer area into memory. But the remaining bytes beyond the Ethernet and VLAN headers are copied directly from the socket buffer data area, which allows for the possible stack overflow. Yeah, now, the attacker does need to be on the same network they're attacking, and of course the host needs to be running one of these vulnerable kernels, but there are several, there's years of them apparently, so you have to keep that in mind. And something else to consider, this exploit can be used for different kinds of attacks, really. I mean, yes, the one we've talked about here is the buffer overflow attack that could conceivably allow you to execute code directly on the system. That's the worst case scenario. But you could also just use this vulnerability to collect information about a host remotely, information that you could then leverage into a more significant kind of attack. And that is something the researchers have seemingly already pulled off. Now, since not every distribution has patched this yet, we thought we'd pass along a quick workaround. If you can't patch for whatever reason, or your distribution hasn't sent you a patch yet, you can disable unprivileged user namespaces, which should prevent exploitation. And we'll have a link in the notes with more details. Everyone's favorite Linux virtualization API got a nice update this week. Libvirt 9.0 was released on Monday, now backed by Red Hat, Libvirt was first released in 2005 by Daniel Burnage while working at Kubernetes. Libvirt provides a portable, long-term, stable C API for managing the virtualization technologies that are offered by Linux. Not just Linux anymore, either. It also targets Windows and Mac OS. And it's really expanded over the years into one of the default virtualization platforms on the market. And it's got robust library support, too, from popular programming languages like C, Python, Go, and more. With 9.0, Libvirt had support for external snapshot deletion, at least with QEMU, using its existing API. 9.0 also now supports PAST, or Plug a Simple Socket Transport, for connecting an emulated network device to the host network. Again, this needs QEMU. That sounds pretty handy, though. And of course, Libvirt supports more than just QMU, but it seems like those particular updates are really significant, and I gotta imagine it's one of the more popular ways people interact with it. I just have a real soft spot for this project. I still remember when it was brand new, and it really was one of those technologies that helped turn Linux into a virtualization powerhouse. The JFS file system was first introduced to the Linux kernel way back in version 2.4.19, released in October 2001. IBM developed the JFS file system originally in the 90s for AIX, and then the second-generation implementation 
was ported over to Linux after it was made open source. And saying it was originally developed for AIX maybe makes it sound old now, but you have to understand back in the day, that actually gave it some credibility. And much like our beloved Riser FS file system, the kernel team now in present day is preparing to deprecate and eventually just completely remove the tried and true journaled file system. All good things must indeed come to an end. But realistically here, JFS is not widely used, and no Linux distribution we know of has ever used it as a default file system. I mean, heck, we love playing around with half-baked file systems, and we've never even bothered to use it. You know, that's, that's probably pretty true. I don't know if I ever have used JFS, definitely not recently. I mean, maybe, maybe back in the uh, bad old days before the extended file system had journaling, that there was a time. That's when we used Riser, so I don't think so. And, you know, I don't think I've seen any new patches land in years, so I guess it kind of makes sense this is coming. Longtime kernel developer Christoph Helwig has now just raised the idea of orphaning JFS. He wrote, quote, A while ago, we deprecated RiserFS and scheduled it for removal. Looking into the hairy metapage code in JFS, I wonder if we should do the same. While JFS isn't anywhere as complicated as RiserFS, it's also way less used and never made it to be the default file system in any major distribution. Huh. Sounds like they don't know of any distro that shipped it either. Well, no firm plans have been made just yet, but we're officially putting JFS on the action death watch list. And quite seriously, if you currently or really ever have used JFS in production, please write in and tell us about it. Linode.com slash LAN. That's where you go to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and it's a great way to support the show while you are checking out some fast, reliable cloud hosting that I give my 100% endorsement to. I think they're the best in the business, and they back it with the best support in the business as well. Real humans, all day, every day. And they're 30 to 50% cheaper than the hyperscalers that have those crazy esoteric platforms that are always trying to upsell you. And on top of that, their performance is great. I think it's better than the hyperscalers. I think it's better than any place I've ever hosted my infrastructure. They got 11 data centers today, but they're spinning up a dozen more this year. And they have great features such as object storage, cloud firewall, backup, Kubernetes, Terraform support, Ansible, and more. Plus an API that's clean, well-documented, and there's plenty of libraries good and ready to go for you to use. Not to mention a command line client, which also takes advantage of that API. That's how I get all my files up on object storage. I think you're really going to be impressed by Linode. I certainly was, and I suspect Linode thinks so as well. That's why they're giving you 100 bucks. So go try it. Go take advantage of it. Go build something. Go learn something. Try it for yourself and support the show. Linode's what we use for everything we deploy. Linode.com slash L-A-N. That's Linode.com slash LAN. And thanks to Collide. Visit collide.com slash LAN. You know the old saying, when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The traditional approach to device security is that hammer, a blunt instrument that can't solve nuanced problems. Even after installing clunky agents that users hate, IT teams still have to deal with mountains of support tickets over the same old issues. And they have no way to address things like unencrypted SSH keys, operating system updates, or pretty much anything going on with a Linux device. Collide is an endpoint security solution that's more like a Swiss Army knife. It gives IT teams a single dashboard for all devices, Mac, Windows, and even Linux, and you can query your entire fleet to check for common compliance issues or write your own custom checks. Plus, Instead of installing intrusive software that creates more work for IT, Collide's lightweight agent shows end users how to fix issues themselves. You can achieve endpoint compliance by adding a new tool to your toolbox. Visit collide.com slash LAN to find out how. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash LAN. After an initial delay, Mozilla has shipped a controversial update that slipped into Firefox 109. Now, it's along with several bug fixes and improvements for Linux users, so it's definitely worth the upgrade. It fixes things like resolving an issue where the YouTube seek bar sometimes didn't work right, 
or issues that caused Firefox to just simply crash when using Sway, just as a couple of examples. But there is a feature that's concerned folks in the most recent Firefox, and it's the addition of Manifest version 3 extension support. With the version Manifest standard set by Google comes the removal of support for extensions that use the Web Request API, which many ad blockers and privacy tools rely on. However, Mozilla has signaled they're empathetic to these concerns and have committed to working with extension developers to transition to the newer API while promising to leave version 2 in place for at least some time. These manifest version 3 extensions, named as such by Google, change how extensions interact with the network, amongst other things. So instead of having direct access to the network and even being able to manipulate network traffic, which could potentially be a security risk depending on how you look at it, the browser will now handle and forward that required data to the extension. Google and Mozilla say that this new declarative net request API will also improve browser performance as the extension accessing your network traffic can no longer hold up the browser's rendering process. And in the case of Firefox, they're shipping this new Manifest V3 with a dedicated extensions menu. This new management UI allows you to enable and disable extensions per site now, at least assuming that particular extension has been updated to Manifest V3. Yeah, and not everybody's loving that new button, so if you do search around, there is a way to disable it. It can be done, but you have to go into the config options. Uh, Some of the reasons that were cited by Mozilla for this transition is compatibility with future Chrome extensions. Mozilla stated that ultimately they feel it's better for the end user if browser extensions are cross-browser compatible. I suppose there is some logic in that, even if it's a controversial standard. In summary, though, the Declarative Net Request API, well, it's aiming to reduce the risk of malicious extensions intercepting sensitive information or being able to inject malicious code into network requests while also aiming to improve the browser's performance. But developers are expressing some concerns around a few key areas. To start with, some of those requests that get blocked, well, those also have an impact on performance, and if they no longer are blocked, that can slow down the browser in its own way. Plus, the introduction of stricter extension signing requirements that's coming along with this, well, that may make it more difficult for small independent developers to distribute their extensions. It's one thing if you're a big dev shop whose primary product is an extension. It's a whole other thing if you just have a whim and want to make a little useful extension for yourself and a few others in your community. Also, the removal of the ability to hide extensions from the user interface could make it harder for users to manage their extensions, And finally, the increase in review times for extensions could make it more difficult for developers to get their extensions and their updates to users in a timely manner. Yeah, that one's interesting. Mozilla has said that part of this change will involve a more thorough review process for extensions before they're allowed to be distributed inside the Firefox browser. And I can see why developers would seem to be concerned that that's going to make things just take longer and it may delay updates to end users. And additionally, The review process looks like it'll be more stringent for extensions that have access to more sensitive browser data, and that's also likely to increase the review time. The developer of one of the most widely used ad block extensions, uBlock Origin, has said that the new API is less powerful than the old web request API and will make it more difficult to create an efficient ad blocking extension. He also stated that the new API may also increase the memory usage of the browser and that it could make it more difficult for users to customize their browsing experience. So it's not all wins here in terms of performance. The developer of another popular ad blocking extension, Adblock Plus, commented on the changes as well and echoed the concerns that this new API is less powerful and that these changes could make it more difficult to create an efficient and well-functioning ad blocking or privacy extension. Now, Some ad blockers have been able to create an alternative solution to the declarative net request API to just sort of keep things working. Still, though, it may require more resources to develop these workarounds and to ultimately maintain the extensions we've come to rely on. Yeah, and likely just more expertise to know how to do those workarounds. And the situation seems even more concerning in Chromeland 
at least Mozilla seems to be committed to working with developers on keeping version 2 of the manifest around for a while and making concessions to their version 3 implementation that could keep some of these ad blocking extensions working. It's really Google's move now. They kicked this whole discussion off, and now Firefox has managed to ship this before Google has shipped it in Chrome. And I think Mozilla has managed to do it in a much more reasonable, much more balanced approach. And so now, <laughs> you know, if Google ships it the way they originally intended, much more restrictive, uh, they're going to look like the bully in a sense. Uh, but it's definitely just something for us to keep our eye on in general. You know we're going to report back to you when we find something new that develops that's worth your attention, just like we do for the entire world of Linux and open source. So be sure you don't miss a single episode. Head over to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get every single new episode. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact to let us know which niche file system you're using this week. <laughs> and don't forget, if you'd like an ad-free version of this here show, you can become a Jupiter.Party member and you get all the JB shows ad-free, including this here Linux Action News. And don't worry, whichever feed you get, we'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. <laughs>